All right, welcome back, everybody, to the 2020 Virtual Kentucky K-12 Technical Summit. We are here with our last session of the day, uh, our 4 p.m. session talking about deployment. Uh, we know that a lot of us, uh, we were just talking about, have been buying Chromebooks and, and Chrome devices for so many years that uh, we we don't do a whole lot of Windows and, and Mac OS devices like we used to. Um, but uh, we've got a great panel with us today, and we're excited to talk about this. If you've got any questions or comments, make sure you're putting those in the YouTube live chat. We've got uh, Clayton Potter and uh, Courtney DeRossett here with us watching the uh, YouTube live chat as well as the Twitter chat. Make sure you hit ca hashtag KYTEX today. And then, of course, at the end of the session, there will be another exit survey uh, for the one-hour ELA certificate as well as feedback for the session, and we really appreciate uh, that feedback. So I will turn it over to these guys. Today we got Mr. Randy Bailey and Mr. Mike Muncy with us, and I will get out of their way uh, and uh, hopefully enjoy this last session, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Neil. Uh, this is Randy Bailey with Letcher County. Uh, I'm going to start doing a little presentation today from a Windows perspective at looking at and trying to do some some deployment for Windows and not only Windows, but deployment for software for Windows machines. And I, I, my intention is to try to get to the point of kind of giving you an idea of what you can do with Endpoint Manager. Uh, previously called uh, Microsoft Intune. So in in trying to do that, there there's a, a couple of scenarios that, that I want to discuss initially. The first scenario is, you know, what do you do with those machines that have died? You know, so you've got a machine that the hard drive's completely dead in. Well, obviously you got to get an operating system back on that machine some way. If you replace the hard drive, I typically tend to use a free product from Microsoft called Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Now, what I like with Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, and I'll go ahead and share my screen here if somebody will verify to me that my screen does share. Okay, let me switch windows for you here. A um, couple of things that that I'll point out here is I, I run Microsoft Deployment Toolkit on an actual server in the district. And the reason I run it on a server, and this one happens to be a Windows 2012 server, I've not upgraded to either of the later operating systems yet. I run it on a server because the first thing that I do on this server is I install WDS, the Windows Deployment Services. What Windows Deployment Services does is it gives me the capability to connect that machine wired to the network, press F12 upon boot, and let that machine boot from the network. When that machine boots from the network, it, I've got it set to do what's called a light touch deployment. Through this light touch deployment, it allows me to name the computer exactly the way I want it to be named, and I can also manipulate and control, you know, what hardware drivers and stuff are pushed to this machine in that installation process. So the only thing that's required to have this Microsoft Deployment Toolkit server set up is you install the Windows Deployment Services. I'll jump back over here for just a second. You have to have the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit as well as the pre-installation environment. And then you can install the actual um, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Now, with those three pieces on there, you get an interface that looks, uh, if I can get it to switch, like this. And, and what you'll see in this interface is I've imported an operating system. Currently, I have Windows 10 build 1903. When I import that operating system, I have the option to deploy Windows Education, Windows Enterprise, Windows Pro, or any of those various different versions that are in there. Uh, I also have the ability to build out drivers for all the different kinds of machines that I have in the district. So when I go in here, you know, I've got these older Dell machines. 
I've got a lot of the newer bite speed machines that I've been buying in different models. And each one of these machines has its own set of drivers. So what I can do is import the set of drivers for that particular machine. And when I push an image to this machine, it had uses variables that are WMI variables written into the machine to be able to pull out the model and the manufacturer and it can drill down and only push this particular set of hardware drivers to that machine. So it saves you a lot of space in your image process. I use the same Windows image for all the different models and machines that we have. And the task sequence of which you install that is where you can go in and define under, uh, let's see, it's down toward the bottom. If I can remember, I, I do some custom installation stuff as well. Uh, right here where it says set driver's path. This is some some essentially variables that you put in there that will allow it to drill down to the make and model of machine and only pull drivers in for that particular machine. So that's a little customization that I do. Uh, Microsoft Deployment Toolkit can do a whole lot more, but just to scratch the surface, I like to use this because it gives me the capability to push only the drivers I need and allows me to stop, name that machine on startup, I even have a file set up in here so that it will allow me to join the domain on startup. It will actually even allow me to select which Active Directory OU that that machine appears in when it joins the domain. So I don't have to go move it in the domain or anything after the fact. If I use MDT to push that image to it, everything is where it needs to be so that the synchronization processes can start afterward. Now, if it's a machine new out of the box, then the only thing, you know, in, in the past, we used to take machines new out of the box and we re-imaged them with Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Here, as of late, I've stopped doing that. Uh, there, there's really no need to have to re-image a machine new out of the box. So what we've done recently is when we take a machine out of the box new, I join it to the domain with the specific name that I want, and I put it in the OU that I want it to be in. Now, once I get it in there, then I've got processes set in place that will get it into the endpoint management system so that I can then push the packages, the, the software packages, the license version. I can control updates. I can do a lot of those different features from the endpoint management side. Let me talk a little bit how you get it into endpoint management. To actually get to endpoint management, you have to have the machine itself become a member of Azure AD. So you've got to get that machine into Azure AD. Now that becomes a little bit complicated because there's so many ways to do it. You, you can actually take a machine out of a box, use a couple different programs, either set up school PC or you could use a uh, Windows Image and Configuration Designer, build a package that's on a flash drive. When you turn that machine on and you get to the out of box blue screen with it booting up, you stick that USB drive in and that machine knows what to do to go out to Azure AD join Azure AD with that machine, and then from joining Azure AD, then the endpoint management join can happen. I typically don't do that because I still find value in some of the things that we control from the on-premise AD. For example, I still want my machines to get McAfee from you know, the state's McAfee EPO deployment. So what I have done is I have set up the hybrid Azure AD join process. Now, the way our state network is configured, this becomes a little bit, a uh, little bit of a chore to get set up. Uh, and, and the first thing that I'll mention is because we have one forest that is essentially connected to multiple tenants, 
the default process for Azure AD join does not work correctly for our machines. So we have to go through a process that's called controlled validation of this hybrid AD join. And what this really means is before Azure AD sync can sync machines as well as people, then we have to push out a couple of registry entries to all of the machines so that they will know exactly which tenant to try to connect to. So this is an article that I can share later if, if anybody wants me to. Um, essentially, what you would have to do to get this process set up is you have to contact the CAT service desk. They have to do a modification to your uh, Azure AD Connect. Now, when they do that modification, none of this is going to really work unless you have these pieces in place. So essentially, it does two registry entries that, is, that really point directly to, and I've got Group Policy Manager open here somewhere. So you can see that the first registry entry points it to a specific value that you get by going to Azure AD. That article shows you how to go get that value and put in here. And then it shows the actual domain name. So that's the two pieces the machine has to know because it can't follow the normal process. Um, once this is in place, every time that Azure AD syncs, when you add new machines and you get them under the, the OUs that actually sync to Azure AD, over a couple, three sync processes, those machines show up in Azure AD as managed computers. Now, once they show up in Azure AD, I have a second group policy in place that actually does the MDM enrollment. And this one actually goes out and says, um, enable automatic MDM enrollment using Azure AD credentials. Now, you have to have some stuff set up on the endpoint management side up front before you start doing any of this. There, there's some basic configuration that you have to do as you would with any uh, MDM type solution. But once all this gets in place, it takes two or three Azure AD sync cycles once you log into an account that is licensed for endpoint management, and that comes along with the A3 and above licenses, um, if you have a machine that is licensed for this, your machines will, will simply show up in Azure AD, and then once you log in with an Intune licensed user, those machines then become Intune managed. Now, if I jump back over here to the Office 365 um, Admin Center, the Endpoint Manager has its own little blade in here. So if I click on Endpoint Manager, it brings me over to this tab that I've already got open. Now, one thing I'll point out, as you see, it shows a whole lot of errors here on device enrollment failures. So those errors in my particular situation, I have an area technology center. That area technology center has never had any licenses deployed to my Letcher tenant. So since those users don't have those licenses, I should have probably been a little more granular on how I sent the policy out to have these try to join but I didn't and now I'm getting a bunch of errors so I've got to rethink that a little bit. But the other thing is I've got to get those area technology center licenses in place so that those users can then also be managed by Intune. But in looking at the endpoint manager, you can look at devices, you can look at the apps you want to deploy, you can do some stuff with endpoint security you can run reports, you can do stuff based on users and based on groups. With, with the devices, if I go here and click all devices, then I start looking at all of the devices that I have inside my district. Now, one thing that I wish was a little different 
the management inside of import manager is not based on organizational units. Those organizational units do not appear here. So when you start managing, you've got to manage based on groups. So what I have done is gone out here and create several groups. And most of the groups that I have, if I search for groups, I have created dynamic groups. So these groups are based on the name of the computer. So for this particular group right here, if this is a computer at the school Arley Boggs Elementary, that's a student Windows 10 desktop. That's my nomenclature that I use. If it starts with that name, then any policies that I assign to this group get deployed to that workstation. Now, the good thing about this is even if we're in NTI territory, Intune works from anywhere. It doesn't have to be on-prem for this to work. So if, you, if I wanted to push today the new version of Edge to all of these machines, I could deploy that application via Intune, and even if those machines are sitting at home, they're going to get that, that application and the configuration that goes along with it. Um, one of the things that I do, I'll kind of just show you a few things that I do here because I'm pushing close to my 20 minutes at this point. But a few of the things that I do with the applications, and I'll just jump to Windows applications. By the way, you can manage iOS, you can manage, this is a full MDM, so you can manage other platforms from this. I push out an older version of Acrobat Reader to some machines. Uh, I push out Firefox, I push out Chrome. Uh, you know, I've got other applications out here. One of the biggest applications that I push is the Office 365 product. Since we have um, the A3 license, we don't want our users to have to authenticate that license on the machine. So Microsoft has the new deployment process where you can do device-based subscriptions. With device-based subscription, the easiest way to deploy that is from Intune. So if you look at properties, you can go in and define all of the different properties. If I click on edit here, I can say, you know, what do I want to happen here? I can define, um, I can define, you know, what channel do I want this to be on? Do I want this to be on the monthly update channel? Do I want this to be on the semi-annual update channel? That does become an issue if you have uh, testing sites, by the way, is you have to stay on the semi-annual upload channel. So you can define all this stuff. Office 365 is built in here as an app that you can go add. Uh, I'll jump back out here and let's just see if I say, uh, da, 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 where's it at? If I go to all apps and I say add, over here at the right, it starts building out these panes. So I can go down here and pick the different things that I want. Um, so, you know, Edge version 77 and later, I can do stuff with it. Windows Defender. Mac OS, there is also a wrapper that you can take like a Firefox app. Since it's not an MSI, you can use a, a special utility that will wrap it and allow it to be deployed through through Import Manager. Um, you've also got all those Office apps. If I choose Windows 10 um, and say select, then it allows me to go start choosing more stuff and I can walk through the different uh, settings there. So once these things are in place, essentially for me, it becomes a process of get it in Active Directory, get it in the correct OU and get it named correctly so that it hits one of the dynamic groups. Once that's done, I just have to give it enough time for it to push the applications from the cloud to the device. That happens whether it's on premise or not, which is a good thing for NTI situations like we're working in today. The other thing that I will point out if I go back to devices is I can also do compliance policies from here. 
which I don't necessarily do compliance policies, uh, configuration profiles. When we started doing uh, testing and the game bar had to be disabled on Windows 10 machines to be able to use them for the state test, I pushed that policy as a configuration profile from Intune. So any machine that is in managed by Intune automatically has the game bar disabled. Uh, I can push uh, power settings for machines that sit in computer labs that are shared by multiple students every day to keep them from having to experience that two to three minute log on if they've never been logged on to the machine before, I push a shared device profile. It essentially well, does several things for me. The first thing is it does not take two or three minutes for that machine to log on. It takes a few seconds, the student is logged on, but the also the other thing that this automatically does is within this configuration, I've defined the amount of space that has to stay free on that hard drive, kind of like a Chromebook does. So when too many people log into that machine, it starts taking those older profiles and automatically deleting them off to ensure that that hard drive stays clear enough to work. And that's similar to the way that a Chromebook automatically dumps extra users off. One of the other things that I do is uh, I push the, the version. So if I take a new machine out of the box from a vendor and it's loaded with Windows 10 Pro, this setting hits it and automatically sends it, and you might see my multiple activation, I'd hit it for me. It automatically sends a multiple activation key to convert the version from that machine from professional up to Windows 10 education. I could change it to enterprise or education, either one, by just changing the key that I deploy to that machine. So I like all my machines to be sitting on the same version. I, I like the features that are in education. So I push the education key, even if they come shipped from the, from the company, you know, with, with a different version. So that's just kind of an overview of some things that you can do here. Now I will go back and click on all devices one more time because uh, one of the things that I want to just briefly talk about is in enrolling devices. You can set up automatic enrollment, but there's also something called Windows Auto Deployment. If you're buying new machines, kind of like the white glove service that you get with a lot of the Chromebooks, you can buy machines from most popular vendors that will automatically enroll those machines into your, your Windows Endpoint Manager domain. And when they come to you and you take them out of the box and connect them to your network, you know, they'll start getting the policies that you apply to them immediately. You have a few additional features with these machines that are in auto deployment or autopilot. You can wipe those machines. You can send those those kinds of commands to it just like you would wiping an iPad or a Chromebook or any of those things. So this this is kind of the push toward the modern world. There are ways that you can run this co-managed with SCCM, uh, but you know this. The thing I like about this is no matter where the machine's at, you don't have to be on the local network to be able to get your packages. If you push the multiple activation key, it doesn't have to talk to KMS to stay licensed. If you're pushing this version of Office 365, it's licensed against the device, not against the user. So you're not constantly having to reauthorize those licensing scenarios. So from a licensing perspective, if that machine doesn't come back on the local network for a year, you know, for most part, it's good with all of its applications. And I've pushed way past my time limit, so I'll stop there. If, if we've got any questions, anybody, I'll, I'll feel free to entertain those and we can get Mike in and let him talk a little bit about the Mac side of the house. All right, can everyone hear me? Hope so. Um, I'm Mike Muncy with Lawrence County Schools. Been known as a Mac geek for a while. Um, um, over the last couple of years, we've lost a lot of abilities with Mac. They have taken away our net installs and the way we used to do imaging. So a lot of us got used to doing workflows with uh, Deploy Studio, and even before that, we would put out ASR, ASR images with um, 
Mike Bond, but just a uh, proton pack server. So, you know, I've been doing it for a little while and those were some of the things that I was accustomed to. But one of the big reasons we can't image like that anymore is because during the installation is when the firmware updates happens on the Macs. Okay, so we, you want to be careful with that because if you do uh, imaging the old way, your Macs may start running kind of wonky on you and it's because they don't have the latest firmware. And uh, you always want to look for that. There's times when you can still do uh, ASR imaging because uh, so we have a lot of 2012 iMac that only run 1013.6 and that's probably, you know, it's going to be updated to a certain point and that's where I'm going to deploy it from now on so I can create ASR images with the tool I'm going to show you today. Um, what I'm using is MDS with, uh, it's from Timothy Perfect and Two Canoe Software. So it's, it's a pretty cool open source software and uh, see what you guys think about it. I've actually been elbow deep in Final Cut for the last few weeks and hadn't seen this version until two weeks ago. <laughs> so. Uh, I've kind of been uh, in the rabbit hole, <laughs> but it's been fun and it's, it's going to work out. So I'm going to try to share my screen here, present to you uh, what, I'm, what we're working on. Just a moment. All right. Can you see my screen now? All right. All right. Sorry about that, folks. So we seeing everything? All right. So you should see where I have MDS up on the screen right now. The first time you open it, you'll you'll start out as security, and you can uh, because you can do a self signed certificate. You can uh, secure your uh, information between your server and your machines. Uh, something else we need to talk about is Max have pretty much lost their server abilities so it seems like mds timothy perfect's building a lot of that into this mds program so you'll look down and we'll see web services monkey and monkey report so anyway here's where you create your self-signed certificate it asks for your dns name and uh, how long it's valid you can uh i'm not going to go in order from the side panel but uh, the first time you set up Monkey, you'll have to download the Monkey tools. And what that Monkey is, if you've never seen it, it's kind of a software repository for uh, curated software that you'll have with your students and your teachers. So you can go out and uh, pull the software down and they don't have to be an admin on the machine to install it. This will be installed locally on all their machines. Okay, so they can run like the testing browser for NWA or install Microsoft Office without being an admin. You can also do updates through Monkey, uh, which is integrated with MDS. So if I go tools, open Monkey admin, and uh, I have some uh, updates to push out. I'd say unintended installs. I know I'm covering this fast guys, but I've got a lot to cover today. <laughs> uh, I can do unattended installs or force install after a certain date. Okay, so that, that's coming in handy. Like if a user's opening this and they never do their updates like users do, I may give it that certain date, like uh, give them a week to install it. It also comes with Monkey Report. If I look at Monkey Report, that will give me some inventory of it information about my fleet i can look at the hard drive size see if they're running out um, i can see that what software has been installed by monkey and everything and uh that's some new stuff that's been in with this so the magic though that we have with uh, mds is in the workflows so i can do a light touch install much like randy was talking about on the windows side uh, we can do that with the Mac side now. So if I get a new uh, new Mac out of the box, you know, I'd, like Randy said, it comes with a perfectly good operating system. Why would I mess with that? So I can go in here and create workflows, do plus and say out of box. And then I can give it 
do not install Mac OS and uh, tell it where my resources are. So as you'll see over here on the right, I have a folder called resources where I set up all of my packages and apps, my profiles, if I wanted to install my MDM for me, my scripts that I want ran and my OS installs. So I can tell it the folder that those are in. So on that new computer, if all I want is Office installed, I could go to the packages and apps, set that up. On first boot, I could tell it to install Microsoft Office. And then I could go to scripts, select the scripts folder, and if I had uh, scripts to run on that machine, this is uh, they would be in this scripts folder. Also, my profiles, because I do my Active Directory through my MDM, so I install my profiles, configuration profiles through this. So I go to my resources folder, pick out my profiles, and I can enable the profiles that I want installed on that machine or that group of machines. So if you see the arrows beside this, I can change uh, the order things are installed in. So right now these are after first boot package. Our first boot packages are installed, but I've, I've found that I have a little better luck installing my profiles after the first user logs in. And I can tell it after uh, running the workflow just to restart, say okay, and that will, that gives me this oob. Um, also, Sorry about that. Finish the resources. Go to user account. I can create my first user account. Like it, well, most of us have a local admin, right? That we always use for the back door. The password. You can allow that user to administrate the computers, and you can hide this user from other accounts. You can create as many users as you want. Okay. And uh, they don't all have to be admins. You can create, like, if you have uh, adult learning, adult ed, you can say uh, student one, student two, if you needed that. Um, if we go to options, I can join uh, the wireless through a SID and password. I can set my computer name, the serial number. And I, or I can also prompt this, and when it's installing, it'll stop and ask me what I want the, the computer name to be. So that may be coming in handy if you install by, or uh, set up asset tags as your computer name, for instance. Um, I trust the server certificate in the system keychain. That goes along with uh, what I showed you with Monkey and Monkey Report. If you trust the server, you can do TLS on that. Uh, skip setup assistant. Enable location services. So I always suggest that you enable location services. Your time will get all kinds of crazy. And uh, you'll see some weird stuff from the Max when the time's wrong. Plus your Active Directory will have problems. Um, sometimes location services doesn't kick in on the first boot on Max. I don't know why, but it, usually this, just give it a reboot and uh, it'll pick up the location services. You can skip the user privacy and uh, enable SSH, allow administrators to screen share, because a lot of times I do mine with um, VNC. So I'll control my computers with VNC, and that'll give me that with screen share. Now you can also use your MDM to enable remote desktop management later, but that's a separate issue, and it's easily done. And you should be able to install monkey reports for the inventory, and it'll push that out to those machines. Monkey, it already knows Monkey's running on this machine, so it sets up the Monkey repo URL for you and sends it out to those client machines, and that's, and that's how it knows where to get this information for the software. And say OK, and that's my out-of-box experience. So I would save that. Oh, right here we have a send login information via post. It knows that this is the server that's running it. And if you look here, I see remote log. 
I've noticed that you have to enable, re-enable this each time you start uh, MDS. So the remote log, it, it gets shut off when you shut down the MDS, but you just have to click it if you're doing a workflow, if you want that information. We go back, I can save this to a volume. That might be like a flash drive. And just pick out the flash drive. It'll write the deploy stuff to it. And what it does is it copies all the resources it needs to that deploy folder. And then it gives it the run script to run the commands. Or I can save it to a disk image. Now, that's what I tend to like to do is save to a disk image. And it creates a DMG that I can put on a web server. And that way I don't have to carry around a thumb drive with me all the time. And I can just point to that web server and uh, run this install. So once you get it saved, what you do is boot to recovery mode on a new, new Mac. So if you used to be, you could hold down uh, the N key, I think it was, and do a net install. Now, if you hold option, you can do it. And it'll come up to your boot methods and you can hit command R or you can just boot with command R, I think. And then you open up terminal. This little screen is just if you've never seen that, you go to utilities terminal when you're in recovery mode. And then within terminal, because I can't show this to you today through, uh, I, I've got an Elgato on back order. So uh, I'm going to kind of give you the what it looks like to run it. So here's the command to mount the website, HDI util mount, HTTP server, and then the DMG file that you're creating. So you see that I get that extra volumes MDS resources now. So if I do a volumes MDS resources run, it's going to bring up image R. Image R is where I get all the workflows from, and it, it handles that information for me. So I'll see the application starting. This is kind of how it'll look when you uh, do this on a machine in recovery mode. So I can pick from all my different setups. So I have a high Sierra image. This new setup is one out of the box that came from straight from Apple. And I have it installing Office and Chrome and my monkey tools. And I can I have high Sierra images. Uh, the reason I say image is because that one's an ASR restore and a Mojave image and just whatever you need for the machines you can do from there. Um, oh, just a second. <laughs> we don't want to restart right now, do we? Um, the way we do an ASR image is with auto DMG. The difference between ASR image in the regular installation file that you get is you can do the ASR image in about 10 minutes versus the full installation, which usually takes about 40 minutes plus doing office or anything you have like that. Um, we use a package called Auto DMG. And of course, this is live, so I'm not going to get it. <laughs> So it'll go out and try to find updates for whatever operating system you're installing. So like if there's a 10.15.6 today, it'll try to download those updates and apply those. I'm going to cancel this right now. And I can see if I go to my install OS resources, I have my installs in here. I have to pull that off of the sparse image because it has to be on an external volume. This is kind of a mess. So here's my image opened up. Uh, I should see install. So if there was updates, it would uh, apply the updates here. It would download those for me. And I canceled that. So, so we don't have that. I can add Office or any other software I want. I don't suggest you do that. I suggest you install that with Monkey. 
Um, but you would click build and that would build your ASR image that you could install in your workflow. So if I was doing a, a workflow here for um, a new image, I could say, here's where I can either pick out the regular installer file. Sorry. See, I can pick out a regular installer file and install that when I'm doing a computer. I can say erase and install, rename the volume and all that good stuff. Or I can do it from a disk image, which is a lot faster. And I would select that disk image, PMG, and install it. And, and then just run through the resources and everything like I did earlier. And I tried to run through this as fast as I could, guys. Uh, we have automatons. You can create uh, Chromebook automatons or Mac automatons with this. You can say configure automaton, and I have it plugged in. Now you have two commands to run. Normally you would just have your volumes MDS and run. It would be your command. But since I'm mounting an HTTP, HTTP uh, folder, I have two commands and I got to separate those by ampersands, double ampersand. And then I just update my automaton. And I boot in option mode, hook my automaton to the back and it takes over. And it'll it'll install everything and run my, all my commands. It'll do the HTML, HDI util mount for me, and then run the run command and set it up. Um, you can download macOS from here. It'll have a list of all of them. Uh, create your installers. Like if you have an older machine, you can create an external boot disk with this. You can select the macOS installer open select target and it'll give you the command there and if you log into it you can either use this and copy it to terminal and run the command or you can click create and uh you could always do that this just gives you an easy way to get there and i think neil i am about out of time but i tried to i kind of tried to push that through pretty fast yeah, that was really great. But I, I will say that all of these sessions today, um, you know, thank goodness they're going to be on YouTube and uh, all of the great information that you guys, um, you know, have provided all day today. Uh, we can always go back and hit pause as we work through that. And um, so uh, really just appreciate everyone's work today and uh, appreciate you and Randy. Uh, this is a fantastic session. I know trying to mash uh, Mac deployment and Windows deployment into a 45 minute session. You guys did absolutely fantastic. Um, that was a that was that was a great session from both of y'all, and uh, and we really appreciate your all.